Hi, welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McKee McGrath, and today we are still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to talk about dogs who saved a town, a hero rat, and some bizarre animal laws around the United States that are still miraculously in the books. Okay, let's go. It's a really weird time. We're in month seven of COVID-19, at least the quarantine part of COVID-19. And for us, we're just now starting to do online learning for our daughter in school. And we are still working from home and pivoting our jobs. Everything is really hard. And my hope and intention for this podcast is for things to be better for you to give you a little bit of an escape by way of my favorite topic, animals. And animals have touched every part of our lives, from history to medicine, to the one curled up at your feet that just makes you feel better at the end of the night. So if you want, go ahead, take a break, and come with me on a journey to Alaska. Before we get there, we're going to talk about some silly animal laws, also in Alaska. If you are new to this podcast, welcome. If you've been around for a little bit, though, you'll notice I'm a huge fan of the absurd and pointing it out. Please see the episode on the exploding whale. But one of my favorite things to talk about are really dumb laws that are still miraculously on the books and that they weirdly exist in the animal world. And they do not disappoint. For example, there's a law in Juneau, Alaska that states that animals cannot enter beauty salons for a haircut. Well, it's pretty evident that it's to prevent human haircutting professionals from getting their grooming on on a golden doodle. But maybe I'm wrong and it's a law banning animals for giving trims. Here is the law in full and you decide. Quote, No owner of any animal or person having control of any animal shall allow such animal to enter into any barbershops or establishments for the practice of hairdressing or beauty culture. See, before a big day, I personally like to pamper myself, but I guess the huskies of the Iditarod are not going to go through the same process. More on the Iditarod later today. These poor dogs are going to have to get their potty cure somewhere else, I suppose. There was one other law that made me laugh. Cats in International Falls, Minnesota, are not allowed to chase dogs up telephone poles. Ten bucks that that law was written by an embarrassed dog. I grew up in a little town called Washington, Maine, and my dad had a team of huskies that we would take out for dog sledding runs for fun. See, can you imagine getting off the bus from school and having 10 dogs howling at your return? See, that was my daily reality. And because we were the family with a dog sledding team, everyone asked if I knew of, heard of, or actually knew Balto. If you haven't heard of Balto, that's okay, we're going to talk about him a little bit later, but... It's important to know that a dog sledding team is just that, a team. There is no I in team or whatever it is your soccer coach told you. The story I was told when I was a kiddo was that there was a dog named Balto who saved the town of Nome, Alaska, from a deadly diphtheria outbreak in 1925. Balto raced against time and got the medicine to a bunch of kids who needed it. But that quick brush stroke of a tail does such a disservice to the full story, which I'm about to tell you now. So tuck in, get some cocoa, or whatever warms your soul, because this story is bonkers. Nome was so far north, just two degrees south of the Arctic Circle. Look on a globe, it's really far north. The port was blocked by ice and was inaccessible from November to July. No ships could get through the dock, so if the thought of running out for emergency toilet paper during this pandemic is a problem now, dot dot dot. It's also one of those places on Earth that are so close to one of the poles that they are light for six months of the year and dark for the other six. The only doctor in this northern town was Dr. Welsh, and he noticed the medication for diphtheria had expired, so while he did put in an order for new medication, it did not arrive before the port closed due to ice. Amazon two-day shipping was definitely not an option in 1925. Because this is how things go... There happened to be an outbreak of diphtheria after the port shut down. When a seven-year-old girl presented with symptoms of diphtheria, Dr. Welsh attempted to administer some expired antitoxin to see if it might have any effect, but 
This girl sadly died a few hours later. Looking back, Dr. Welsh realized the handful of kids who died in late December had very similar symptoms to the girl. Welsh did everything he could, but he had limited resources and no way to get help before the bacteria spread. And this bacteria could spread. Realizing that an epidemic was imminent, Dr. Welsh called the mayor, and a quarantine was necessary and implemented. Sound familiar? The following day, on January 22, 1925, Dr. Welsh sent radio telegrams. Remember, no cell phones, and it's too cold for carrier pigeons, to all other major towns in Alaska and to Washington, D.C., asking for assistance. An epidemic of diphtheria is almost inevitable here. Stop. I am in urgent need of one million units of diphtheria antitoxin. Stop. Mail is only form of transportation. Stop. I have made application to the Commissioner of Health of the Territories for an antitoxin already. Stop. There are about 3,000 white natives in the district. Without the antitoxin, the mortality rate, or death rate, would be close to 100%. This also included the surrounding region's population of about 10,000 people. Nearly everyone who contracted this illness would die. And this was so close on the heels of the 1918-1919 flu that killed 50 million people worldwide, including half, half of the native people of Nome just six years before. A thousand people died in Nome to that flu, and 2,000 died over the entire state of Alaska, mostly natives who were unable to resist the disease. So how are they going to get the medication to Nome? The only way to do this was by dog sled. I mean, experts said the only way to do this was by dog sled. There was one reporter slash publisher, William Thompson, who had what I'm going to say is probably the worst nickname in this story. Wrong font Thompson. (laughs) Of the Fairbanks Daily News miner and aircraft advocate who helped line up a pilot and plane. But Wrong Font used his paper to write scathing editorials because he wanted airplanes to save the day, not dogs. The Navy, experienced pilots, and the governor all supporting in part due to predicted impossibly bad conditions, a decision to have two fast relay teams of dog-pulled sleds to get the medicine ASAP to the top of the world. But Wrong Font hated this, and while he wasn't an expert— He used his paper to write opinion pieces in support of airplanes, dissing the dog sleds, and wrote venomous pieces against the leadership who was trying to use expert advice to save lives. So, in a sense, it's a tale as old as time. And keep in mind the support. It was to put mushers in harm's way to save the town with everything against them. The pilots could crash and die, taking the medicine with them. But the safer option was if one musher fell off a cliff and died of frostbite, No one would ever find them, and other mushers would wait and risk hyperthermia or death also, not knowing their relay was broken. And again, this is the preferred, safer option according to the experts. For starters, it usually took a month for mail to get from Nanaina to Nome by dog sled. But the fastest run was run by Leonard Zapala in just nine days. Nine days is an all-out run— Little sleep, dangerous for dogs and mushers alike, but Zapala was an expert in fast dogs in dangerous conditions. And that incredibly fast speed, nine days, still was not fast enough. The medication would not survive the cold for more than six days. Phrases like the temperature had warmed slightly, but at negative 62 degrees Fahrenheit came up frequently in my research. Warming anything to negative 62? Of course it couldn't get worse, right? (laughs) Wrong. Temperatures were at a 20-year low, with temperatures 50 degrees below zero and winds gusting at 25 miles an hour, which swept snow into 10-foot drifts. 10 feet. Remember, that's a basketball hoop. Snow was blowing that high. Travel by sea was hazardous and across the interior of most forms of transportation was shut down. So sure, let's go for a dog sled ride. The dog started on January 27th, 1925, but by January 30th, things were looking bleak in Nome. 
the disease continued to take lives and spread even with the quarantine in place. So it, it turns out many people got this illness before realizing they had it and had started to spread. By the 30th of January, a Nome reporter said, all hope is in the dogs and their heroic drivers. Nome appears to be a deserted city. Everyone wanted this medicine to get to Nome, but to think that it was just one dog and a jaunty journey on a picturesque snowscape couldn't be further from the truth. I can tell you, running a dog sled is hard work. Often you're running with the dogs in all your gear, big boots, frostbite on your nose, your body might never feel warm again. Wind pushing into your face, it's brutal. And the furthest I ever had to go was five miles, and I could just zip home, watch cartoons, and drink hot cocoa because I was nine. Please keep in mind all of that when we go over just some of the obstacles and parts that you probably never heard about in this impossibly difficult journey. For example, the first musher in the relay team was named Wild Bill Shannon. Because I'm pretty sure everyone was called Wild Bill in 1925. My great-grandmother was probably Wild Bill Grandma. So when Wild Bill arrived to the first checkpoint to hand off the medicine to the second runner in the relay, he had hypothermia and his face was blackened from frostbite. Three of his dogs died due to the disastrous conditions on the trail, including having to take a slightly longer route because the trail he was on was destroyed by horses. I have no idea what that means. I'm taking their word for it. It's reported the second musher, Edgar Kelland, had to have warm water poured on his hands to remove them as they were frozen to the hold bar of the dog sled. Another musher, Charlie Evans, had to pull the dog sled himself for part of this journey when his dogs got frostbite and could no longer pull the sled. He put the dogs in the basket of his sled, and when he arrived to hand off the antitoxin, he noticed both of his dogs had died due to the conditions. So Balto generally gets credit for saving the town by getting the medicine to the kids of Nome, as he was the lead dog who pulled the sled up to the town and was the first dog the kids, the doctor, the parents, the townsfolk, the natives, they all saw through the snow. And he should absolutely get credit for this. However, keeping these other men and dogs in mind absolutely makes this story significantly more powerful. So back to Balto's 55-mile contribution. 55 miles from my apartment is Providence, Rhode Island. It's about an hour car ride on the highway, and it's way longer than one mile that your gym teacher has probably asked you to run for fitness tests. I have done that drive in blizzarding snow, and it has taken me as much as three and a half to four hours before in terrible conditions in a car with a radio blaring, heat on, and a cup of coffee in the cup holder. 55 miles distance for those not New England is a little more than running back-to-back -back marathons in the same day. It's a long, unforgiving run in the best of days, let alone in the dead of winter, that close to the North Pole, in the dark. While Balto pulled into the town to save the kids, it was Leonard Sapola. Remember, the guy who did this in nine days in a race, and his trusty dog Togo taking the league in the longest, most dangerous leg of this journey— through ice, through snow, through biting cold, cold so cold it would burn your lungs, over hills, mountains, crevasses that are hidden by snow, so one misstep, and you, your dogs, your team, and the medicine, would fall hundreds of feet to certain death and be buried by snow never to be found. Balto's 55 miles is only a small chunk of this run. Togo? He ran 261 miles. That is almost five times the distance that Balto had led. He also had to travel over 170 miles just to get to the route to carry the medicine and meet his relayer on the trail, all orchestrated without cell phones, <coughs> texting, <coughs> or location tracking apps. I'm lost. Not only were the people of Nome dependent on Sapola, his dog Togo, his speed, but they took a dangerous shortcut in a storm that was blowing hurricane-force winds, plunging the temperatures to 85 degrees below zero. Part of their leg included clearing Little McKinley, a mountain over 5,000 feet high. The conditions were so amazingly bad, Sapola couldn't see his hand in front of his face, so he had to trust his dog, Togo, to lead the way to the checkpoints and relay teams en route. The dog navigated ice, cliffs, and did not get lost. 
He didn't fall into open and deadly stretches of water near the coast, essentially blinded by the wind and snow, and Togo did it. Meanwhile, Dr. Welsh, noticing the conditions were getting worse, put a hold on the relay. He phoned all the checkpoints to say, please stop, we'd rather get medicine a little late. I can do what I can, but the risk is too high for the mushers, for the dogs, and we could lose all the medicine. Do not come until this storm passes. But the messages were never received. The lines were dead. So the dogs kept going. By the time Gunnar Kaysen, the last musher of the race with his lead dog Balto, received the antitoxin, the storm was, believe it or not, getting worse. How can it get worse? Well, that's how these stories go. The wind was so severe, and besides not being able to see his wheel dogs, the dogs closest to the sled, Gunnar Kaysen's sled was knocked over by intense wind. He lost the cylinder that had the serum when the dog sled dumped over, so Gunnar Kaysen didn't risk this much. None of the dogs or the mushers did. None of the dogs died for this, only to lose the antitoxin so close to Nome. So he took off his gloves in negative 70-degree wind, and started to dig in the snow. He found the cylinder, but at a cost. He suffered frostbite on both of his hands, and while Kaysen was supposed to hand off the medicine to one more musher, when he arrived at that checkpoint, miraculously early, even going miles out of his way because they lost the trail and losing the antitoxin, the other musher was asleep, thinking he had more time. So Kaysen, already moving, just kept going, racing to Nome with Balto at the lead, his hands in excruciating pain, and he got there half a day early. This team had six days to get the medicine to Nome. They did it with a half a day to spare against all odds, in hurricane force winds, whiteout conditions, and the worst winter in 20 years, just a few years after a global pandemic wiped out a large population of native Alaskans. The medicine was defrosted and usable by lunchtime thanks to these incredible mushers and the dogs who saved not just a town, but the surrounding regions at the top of the world that are almost always forgotten. When Balto ran to save the kids and the town and the native people, he was eight years old, an experienced dog who would have been considered middle age, and more likely than not would not run a big race again if this were a race and not to save lives. But Togo? When he ran in 1925, he was 12 years old. That's like your grandfather's running marathons in ice in the most brutal conditions on Earth. Huskies live between 12 and 15 years in general, so Togo, at the end of his life, did the hardest and longest leg of the race for mercy. A little bit on Togo. This pup was purchased by the musher, or person who runs a sled dog team, Leonard Sapala. After Togo developed a painful throat condition, Sapala tried to sell him, but the dog refused to go. And when I say he refused, he refused. When Togo was forced to leave, he jumped out of a window of his new owner's house and ran the whole way home to Leonard Sapala. He was a mischievous pup who was an insatiable runner, which was so very necessary to saving the town of Nome a few years later. In 1960, Sapala said, I never had a better dog than Togo. His stamina, his loyalty, his intelligence could not be improved upon. Togo was the best dog that ever traveled the Alaska Trail. Balto had a statue erected in his honor in New York City. Balto's story got a bit sad after the serum run. Movie producers wanted to have the dogs film a reenactment of the race. None of the film, sadly, has survived to today, but Gunnar Kaysen was never paid, and the dogs were expensive to keep. So as a result, Gunnar Kaysen had no choice. Balto and his team was sold to a dying museum where a man named Kimball heard their story and decided to do something for these dogs. He told the owner of the store that he would buy the dogs for $2,000. That's a ton of money back then. But there was a catch. He only had two weeks to raise this money. So, school children in Cleveland, Ohio, would go around with buckets to collect change, donations, money, whatever they could to help Mr. Kimball buy Balto and the team. There was no Kickstarter. 
There was no GoFundMe options. There was no internet. But there were newspapers and rumor mills. And the Cleveland Plain Dealer paper stepped up and promoted the effort to save Balto after he saved the people of Nome. Factory workers collected money in hats. Kennel clubs donated money to buy the dogs, but also to have them transported to Ohio, where he and his team lived out their days at the Brookside Zoo, now the Cleveland Metro Parks Zoo. He died at 14 years old in 1933, a great old age for a husky. His body is in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Both dogs are heroes, as is every one of those 150 dogs and 20 mushers who ran these teams. These dogs inspired people to get vaccines for illnesses like diphtheria, which, thankfully, due to vaccines, is not something we have to worry about nowadays. And within the decade, bush planes were able to get to northern towns after the ship ports closed, replacing much of the need for long-distance dog sledding for emergency medical transportation. The Iditarod dog sled race from Anchorage to Nome is based on this mercy run, where mushers from all over the globe take their dogs and run to a town two degrees below the North Pole every March. Thanks to climate change, snow has had to be driven in for the start of the race for photo ops and interviews where the traditional start was. Then the dogs are moved further north to start the race officially. So to my daughter, AC, and to our friends who listen... When we parents say, I know COVID quarantine feels like it will never end, know this. Every pandemic has come to an end and things will go back to something like normal. You will get to go outside again. You will get to play with your friends again. You will get to hang out without masks again and go to the museum and the beach. There are smart people, doctors, scientists, and yes, even animals like the horseshoe crab, who we will talk about in another episode who are helping us figure out how to get a vaccine. And we have people who are trying to keep us safe. We also luckily have history to show that with the diphtheria outbreak, the 1919 flu epidemic, the Black Plague, and so many more, all have one thing in common. They ended. And this one will too. Now, I know a lot of people don't like rats, but to me, they are super smart, incredibly trainable, and very sweet. Plus, they can be funny. But while dogs are trained to find explosives, they are too heavy and might trigger an explosion of a long-forgotten landmine, which can kill and hurt people. So rats have been trained in the Balkans, an area ravaged by war, to find explosives. Unlike other creatures, they are searching for explosives themselves and not metal, So they're not distracted by coins or other metals that might be left in the dirt and are shiny as well. Rats are small enough to not set off explosives. They are cheap. They work incredibly fast. And because some mines are plastic, they can find these dangerous landmines that wouldn't ever be detected by a human with a metal detector. And best of all, using rats was the idea of a graduate student named Bart Whiteyens. Wheatens? Wheatjins. I'm so sorry, Bart. He watched a show about a peace treaty, and he looked over at his own pet rats. He had already trained them to find objects and bring them to him in exchange for food, so he went to the government and just asked for money to try to train these rats. And they've been using them for 20 years. So kids who participated in the summer camp virtual camp in Somerville, Massachusetts during the COVID-19 crisis got to learn all about these amazing rats. And if any of you are listening, I wanted to give you an update, one that I'm sure you are not at all surprised at. In late September, a rat named Magawa had been awarded the gold medal for detecting unexploded landmines in Cambodia. So remember back in episode one, when we talked about bees in Croatia who could detect landmines? The Croatian bomb bee inspired this entire podcast, and there are other animals who save people from unexploded underground landmines. And rats are just one in the post-war fight for safety. They are light enough that they don't set off explosives, they are super easy to train, and they are incredibly fast workers. Magawa can clear 35 acres. Remember from Mrs. O'Leary's cow, one acre is 16 tennis courts in a 4x4 formation. So that is a lot of tennis courts he's searching with that adorable tiny twitching nose. 
He alone has found 39 landmines and 28 items of unexploded ordinances. These include 2.7 million tons of cluster bombs dropped by the United States. A quarter of those bombs did not explode, meaning they are still very active and can hurt or kill people. Cambodia has the highest number of amputees. People who, due to injury or illness, have had their arms, legs, hands, or feet removed. 25,000 of them are unexploded ordnance-related amputees, and 64,840 deaths so far are directly related to mines and explosives. It is estimated that there are 3 million unexploded landmines in Cambodia, and only half of the land has already been cleared, meaning Magawa and his friends have a lot of work still left to do to help people stay safe. So don't poo-poo rats. I think they are smart, wonderful, trainable, and amazing animals who tend to get a bad rap in kids' books, like Templeton of Charlotte's Web, and in Folklore. If you want to read a great book that will inspire a new love of rats, book even appropriate for young readers, I would suggest 7+. Plus. Please look at The Amazing Maurice and His Educated Rodents. It's a Discworld book written by my favorite author, Terry Pratchett, where he has a different spin on the Pied Piper folk story. You find yourself cheering for the rats, and you will never see them the same way again. And yes, adults, you will like this too. If you have read this book, then you'll know all about dangerous beans and peaches and the bone rat. If you've read any of the other Discworld series, I'll just say SQUEAK in all caps, and hopefully you'll smile. So thanks for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who change the world, animals who get a bad rap, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, please feel free, send them in. Tell me about your favorite animals. Bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, bewilderbeastpod on Facebook, and bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I am Melissa McHugh McGrath with Mutt Stuff Media, author of Considerations for the City Dog. Now go get curious. I got today's information from CNN, Cambodian Mine Action and Victim Assistance Authority, Apopo, BBC, National Park Service on Togo, Cleveland Museum of Natural History on Balto, Wikipedia on the Serum Run to Nome, bandofcats.com and pawculture.com on weird animal laws. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Shout out to Terry Pratchett. Rest in peace. Links, including Terry Pratchett's The Amazing Maurice and His Educated Rodents, are in the description of today's episodes. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Lebowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and please share with your curious friends. The more you talk about this podcast, the more curious people can learn about fascinating things. Thank you so much for listening.